And now I hand over to Joseph Benedek, who is the chair of um, Henry's keynote. Joseph. Thank you very much, Sally. I am very, very uh, honored to uh, have this opportunity to moderate the uh, opery, opening uh, plenary uh, speech, which uh, will be delivered by uh, Professor Henry Young, uh, which is really a great honor also for, uh, for, the, for the whole conference. Uh, I would like to... <laughs> Uh, it, it is not needed to introduce, of course, uh, uh, Henry, because uh, everybody working in this field knows uh, his, his works. But uh, I will mention only a few facts. Uh, 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 the first of uh, all is that he is distinguished professor at the National University of Singapore. He has received uh, two major awards, uh, one of, from the American Association of Geography, Distinguished Scholarship Honors, and the second one from the Royal Geography of Society, it is the Murchison Award, which are the highest awards uh, in the field of geography. He's also academician uh, of the Academy of Social Sciences in the UK. His research interests uh, uh, are related to the theories of geography of transnational corporations. It was a great honor that to me to introduce to you the conference. Please, now the, the microphone is yours. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you very much uh, to be here. And uh, I'm very excited to be here with you coming all the way from Singapore, arriving uh, midnight last night. Uh, and it's uh, Singapore midnight now, so uh, I'm a bit drowsy, but never mind. Uh, first of all, very much uh, thanks to the Regional Studies Association uh, when Daniela invited me sometime July last year. Uh, none of us would have thought that we would be able to get together in person. So uh, I'm very, very happy to be uh, seeing all of you in person. Um, it's great to be uh, together and uh, exchange ideas and so on. Um, yes, uh, we have Zoom uh, transmission, uh, but it can never be the same as uh, in person together. So you can feel the spirit. Yeah? I can feel it. So first of all, thank you all for uh, being here and uh, listen to this presentation. What I've done is to bring together some of my work, you know, to make it relevant to perhaps uh, the conference theme uh, in terms of uh, global transformation and re uh, global uh, dynamics and regional transformations. Uh, I was asked to uh, sort of think through some of the key issues related to uh, Central and Eastern Europe. So I will try my best, although as uh, many of you might know, I don't have direct expertise uh, on the region. So. Uh, what I'm going to do uh, is to give this presentation, it's about 45 minutes, so that we have up to uh, half an hour for Q&A, or of course, caffeine injection, yeah? coffee waiting. Um, I will talk in relation to three aspects. First is to say something about, if you like, the pandemic challenges, uh, because in a way, we are also trying to develop future research agenda through this conference. So in that sense, it will be useful to think through some of the key uh, if you like, pandemic-related challenges uh, in relation to regional transformations. Second is to relate some of these challenges to the kind of global production networks, global value chain work that uh, I'm familiar with, uh, to kind of problematize some of these challenges uh, in relation to what I call the trouble with global production networks. Uh, so there are troubles in relation to those kind of uh, global connections, so to speak. Uh, and then, of course, finally, I want to give you a little bit of empirical specificity um, by linking it back to the kind of electronics industry work that I'm familiar with. I'm very familiar with electronics. So I will say something about the electronics industry. So there will be some empirical um, towards uh, the third part of, uh, of the presentation. And I will kind of also try to link it back to a little bit to uh, Central and Eastern Europe because I do have a little bit data on on that aspect, all right? Uh, so pr today's presentation is based on my three recent uh, uh, books. First with uh, Neil Cole in 2015, when we developed the so-called theory of uh, global production networks, uh, some called GPN 2.0. And then to my uh, 2016 book, in which we I look at the political economy of uh, industrial transformation in uh, East Asia. And finally, uh, as uh, Joseph has uh, kindly mentioned, the uh, recent work uh, looking at the uh, global uh, production networks in the electronics industry, uh, which you will see, see a bit of the empirics. Now, before we begin, we know we all had uh, suffered 
hopefully, you know, survive through this uh, difficult pandemic era, something must have happened, right? But of course, we know it's more than just the virus. But there are other things. There are cheap crises uh, to do with semiconductors. Uh, and hence, if you think of uh, major challenges, we are facing, of course, uh, food supply issues. We are facing geopolitical tensions, so on and so forth. So we do experience very difficult challenges in this area. Uh, some call it the crisis of, uh, of uh, global production um, to do with, uh, of course, some of the issues that are already mentioned right at the beginning, I think when Sally introduced. So the real question is, how do we try to uh, kind of tackle and understand some of these difficult issues? Um, are they to do with, if you like, the fact that the world got too interdependent, right? Or uh, there is excessive concentration of, uh, I'm thinking in economic terms, of production activities in one part of the world and so on and so forth. So that's the kind of starting point uh, for my presentation. Now, the problem is that I actually don't see the screen. So, okay, I can't turn this. I don't want to back face you too much. So, okay, I'm, I shall try to remember what's in the screen. Okay. So um, again, just preliminary, we know there are major chip crisis uh, shortages in the past two years. Right now, it's slightly getting better, but still, you know, situation has not completely improved. But you must have, uh, he have heard of this, whether in terms of your uh, electronic devices or the automotive you are trying to order, it takes time because of the chip supply shortages issue, all right? It affects many different industries. Uh, even my own book uh, has uh, suffered from uh, global supply <laughs> Um, chain problems, all right, because of uh, shipping and logistical difficulties. Uh, of course, uh, in this part of the world, as well as in North America, there is a great deal of talk about uh, bringing semiconductor production back to the region, whether in uh, Europe or in the United States, to the extent that uh, the recently passed 52 billion US uh, Semiconductor Act. And uh, in Europe, you also have your equivalent uh, of having more chips uh, the European Chips Act, 43 billion euro, uh, all these kind of chips, if you like, uh, which are edible as compared to semiconductor ones. All right. So the key issues uh, we are facing in the post-pandemic era, by post-pandemic, I mean in the next three to five years. All right. I mean, hopefully by then, we are not talking about pandemic, but post-pandemic, hopefully. All right. Uh, first is that the geopolitical tension will looks likely to persist for a while, uh, but here I'm focusing more on the economic aspect, so I'm not going into so much, if you like, uh, political geography, geopolitics uh, uh, presentation, uh, but just list them uh, as, as an issue for you to consider. Uh, it, it ranges from, of course, uh, US-China relations to this part of the world, whereby, of course, the recent aggression of Russia would have most likely lasting impact on European uh, uh, geopolitical condition. And that's something that will seriously affect, of course, all kinds of regional uh, um, um, change and uh, economic development processes. Second is the issue of technology, right? Technology seems to be arising from the crisis also, the major frontier of, if you like, tension and conflicts, uh, ranging from, of course, uh, US-China relational, you know, US is trying to impose uh, technological restrictions on China, uh, there are, of course, countermeasures also in then China's response to this. Uh, there are other countries which are advancing technologies, but then get embroiled in this kind of uh, major geopolitical play uh, in the world. So again, these are issues that will influence how we think through uh, regional and uh, local development processes. Uh, there are also arising from the pandemic, uh, what I will argue, uh, interventionist, sometimes even protectionist policies being uh, applied, which if you think of the past 20 years, and I think as um, early president mentioned about globalization, it wasn't so uh, intense in the past because of course the world went through a whole phase of neoliberalization, right? The Washington consensus in the 1990s and uh, 2000s. So this state intervention very much say in the US context, has led to all kinds of uh, unusual changes, all right? That the least to, for me to say. First is to, if you think of, uh, again, the, uh, the investment in uh, semiconductors industry, uh, as well as a whole host of reshoring activities, the idea of bringing economic activities, particularly of high value uh, added ones, 
back to the home country. So the kind of made in ex ex uh, home country, if you like, uh, activities. These are again the kind of uh, issues and policy instruments that will not go away easily. Will likely to persist throughout this particular decade until at least the end of uh, the 2020s, uh, whereby we will see there is a lot more inducement, explicit or, or implicit, by the state, uh, whether in uh, North America. Uh, I'm not entirely familiar with Western Europe situation, but I suspect there, was, there is more government talk of intervening in some of these activities. And this is the Trump uh, opening of Foxconn's uh, investment in Wisconsin, which had its own problem. Um, finally, of course, the issue of decoupling. Many of you will have heard of the idea that there are, if you like, political pressures and initiatives to try to reduce so-called manufacturing dependency on one country. And that country in mind is China, right? Uh, primarily due during the pandemic, uh, there is a great deal of talk. Now, I won't be able to go through each of the bullets, but it's just to illustrate that, ironically, despite all the talk during the past two years, you will find that uh, funny enough, foreign direct investment into Asia, particularly China, continue to rise rather than decline. So that's counter uh, um, opposite to what politicians would like to tell you. All right, the real world of economic activities remain heavily concentrated in this case China or China plus X plus one plus two means uh, very often in Southeast Asia. Uh, there is some relocation of uh, economic activities outside China to say Southeast Asia, sometimes by the very Chinese firms themselves. Um, so again, there is not a wholesale uh, decoupling. Uh, partly you will find out later why, because it's actually very difficult to do so in a very interconnected world of production. Um, so um, what else do I want to tell you? Ah, reshoring back to the US is actually very difficult. Why? Because uh, even the US, Canada, Mexico agreement in itself is already very difficult to implement, let alone bringing manufacturing back to the US, which again create all kinds of um, um, uh, enormous difficulties, uh, mainly because uh, there is shortage of infrastructure, of uh, required um, human resources, and so on and so forth. And in that sense, one may argue that not just Southeast Asia can benefit from this so-called getting out of China syndrome, but also I can think of Central and Eastern Europe for obvious reason you will find out later uh, because there, there is significant market in this region and Central and Eastern Europe is actually very well positioned in terms of, uh, as we find out, the, uh, the, the, the availability of uh, land resources and even human capital. Yeah? Okay, so in order to understand this issue, um, I propose that we can talk a little bit more about the sort of global dynamics at play, but global dynamics is a term, but we need to unpack it, right? So what does global dynamics mean in this particular context, in the economic sphere? Uh, very much we think of how, if you like, global production is organized. And here there is a very strong research um, strand developed in the social science literature broadly across including business school uh, that refers to broadly speaking global production networks and or global value chains you know, these two are sort of slightly interchangeable terms and you'll find that there are distinct communities uh, we know each other very well uh, gpn and gvc scholars gvc scholars in particular arranged, uh, i mean associated with the likes of uh, gary giraffe a sociologist at duke uh, Tim Sturgeon, uh, economic geographer by training at MIT, uh, John Humphrey, a development uh, economist at Sussex, um, and they are the real pioneers of GVC studies. And of course, I'm associated also with the so-called Manchester School uh, of uh, Global Production Networks uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, we, we have done a recent uh, review paper in Journal International Business Studies, if you're interested in, in that whole literature, which is fairly enormous. We are also very interconnected too. Um, in this literature, the two, two strands broadly conceived, um, there are studies, and I, I've just listed some of the papers only, right, that deals primarily with the governance of global value chain. In other words, how do all these interconnections on a global scale govern? How are they governed? Governed by what kind of uh, actors, lead firms, so on and so forth. And then what 
does that governance mean for industrial upgrading at the local and regional scale, right? So how do industries, firms in specific localities and regions get upgraded um, technologically and or in product and services over time in relation to global value chain governance? And in more recent work, uh, GVC scholars also look at power relations, uh, how that plays out in terms of uh, international relations, in terms of local central relations, government, and so on and so forth. In the GPN literature, which is more associated with the field economic geography, where I, am, uh, I come from, uh, we look at more in terms of how uh, actors and economic activities tend to have local and regional embeddedness, right? I mean, geographers, we tend to look at things more spatially, if you like, local and regional connections. Um, we also develop a particular concept known as a strategic coupling, the idea of uh, regions with assets that can couple with the interests of uh, actors uh, in global production networks. And that coupling process uh, would be known as strategic coupling that enable uh, certain regions to be more uh, advanced in development. So the idea of uh, endogenous, I mean, what Joseph has earlier mentioned, endogenous uh, assets in regions can be coupled with global production networks. In, in my more recent work, uh, I've also uh, try to link this idea of strategic coupling with uh, what's called the evolutionary economic geography literature in order to showcase how evolutionary economic geography focusing very much on if like regional assets and uh, and a related variety in the in development and particularly in the European regions, right? I mean, EEG is extremely well applied in European regions, smart specialization and what have you uh, can also be, um, if you like, expanded uh, in terms of understanding strategic coupling. And uh, lead author like uh, Ron Boschma has recently, recently published his uh, annual lecture of uh, area development policy, again, RSA journal, uh, which respond to this particular idea. So you might be interested in that. You, some of you familiar with GVC literature might have seen this diagram uh, that shows you how GVC uh, is governed in relation to different kind of uh, GVC system, modular production system at the top, relational production system, captive production system in this uh, journal review of, of international political economy, the paper published in 2005. This is the most famous GVC paper, all right? And you will find out that we are interrelated. Uh, this was, uh, this happened uh, two years, three years ago in New York at the uh, Society for Advancement of uh, uh, Social Economics Conference. You will see uh, Tim Sturgeon, John Humphrey in the middle and Gary Giraffe. So you see the paper, almost 10,000 citations now, uh, as well as John Humphrey's paper in regional studies, 2002. All right, Humphrey and Smith, how does insertion in global value chains affect upgrading industrial upgrade, uh, clusters? I think also one of the most cited paper uh, in regional studies, I think after Ron, uh, Ron Boschmas, 2005 paper, I think. All right, so again, just to give you some idea of the, the literature back, background, uh, two, two months ago, we were at the SASI conference in Amsterdam. You will see again um, um, Tim Sturgeon and Gary Giraffe and the whole gang um, at uh, SASI uh, Society for Advancement in Social Economics, where GPNs uh, and GVC scholars tend to cluster and form the whole stream. Okay, so I've given you some uh, literature background, some of the actors involved in this literature. Now, let me give you some, some more sort of idea about the trouble with global production networks. Uh, in relation to the kind of uh, conceptual framework that we have developed. Okay, so in our, uh, Neoko and myself, in our work, we have thought of how we can think of uh, global dynamics, right, on the left, shaping firm behavior and firm respond through particular sets of strategies. And that entire uh, causal mechanism will lead to specific organizational outcomes that will impact on regional development. Okay, so that's the theory. And if, you are, if I were to put it together, with dynamics affect strategies that will then create certain value capture trajectories that will lead to certain kind of development outcomes. But for today's purpose, I will focus just on one dimension, which is risk environment that shape firms from particular national regions that in turn leads to uh, extra firm bargaining, all right? Because I think, in the context of this conference um, theme, uh, the idea of, if you like, heightened uh, global risks, uh, particularly in relation to geopolitical tensions, will have mattered a lot. So I'm focusing on just this part 
uh, regulatory and geopolitical risks, which uh, this table is reproduced from my book, just to show you that how risk environment as, as kind of one element of change, one causal mechanism, as we call it, could lead to significant outcomes. So if you think of regulatory change, geopolitical risk, right? And that can lead to disruption and termination of uh, global production. So if you think of US trade sanction on China's Huawei, ZTE, SM, uh, uh, SMIC is a semiconductor firm in China. And that's just one example. It, it's not the only example. For the second example I use is even Japan's restriction on chemical and gases. You know, you need chemical and gases for chip making on Korean firms in 2019 in response to Korean government, uh, actually Korean uh, uh, high court, highest courts ruling on Japanese comfort women compensation matter, right? So even the Japanese government imposed geopolitical risk by banning its firms supply of those essential elements to Samsung and SK Hynix semiconductor manufacturer. So as you can imagine, it's not just China, all right, but also South Korea, anybody who depend on anybody else, so to speak, can suffer from this kind of risk change due to geopolitical and or national consideration and very often in the name of national security, right? Uh, and then what happened? You will then lead to uh, all kinds of uh, firm level organizational change, uh, including firm level responses, setting up new uh, operations in relation to avoiding possible future um, uh, capture by such risk, to even uh, firm level uh, behavior, uh, setting up your own, if you like, production of those elements. All right. So, in this World Bank um, document, also looking at um, pandemic challenges, you will see that. COVID leads to all kinds of uh, shocks at supply level, demand level, and of course, uh, policy level changes, which in turn lead to all kinds of uh, disruption in production activities, ranging from uh, operational change to logistical uh, um, uh, challenges to uh, access to uh, inputs and or supplies to even consumption. So for example, you can national a regulation on uh, consumer access to certain goods and services, so on and so forth. The idea is that once you start breaking down some of these elements, you realize that the trouble with global production networks is actually indeed very troublesome. All right. Why? Because any element in the whole production system that get unexpected disruption, it will lead to major sort of ramification throughout the whole network and all system. All right. So this is not something that you can easily avoid. You, you can predict in advance. But then, of course, we are used to an era previously before the pandemic that things wouldn't be so bad and so suddenly disrupted. Right. So that's why uh, once we unpack, if you like, the dynamics at work in global production networks or global value chains, then we realize that, ha ha, when happening. Yeah, just in time is beautiful, right? Uh, because everything is so efficient. But once you have a, 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 some disruption in the middle of it, just in time breaks down, yeah, so to speak. So in terms of going back to uh, understanding this trouble with uh, global production network, is that we, I think it's important, and this one I captured in the uh, EPA uh, paper recently in 2021, by saying that we need to unpack what's happening in particular industries. So it's useful at regional uh, studies level to unpack the specific regions you're interested in, the kind of industry, the dominant industries that are important for the region to understand the happenings in, that, in the, each of the industries. Because only when you unpack those boxes, then you're able to see how certain changes, whether it's to do risk and or to do costs and other kind of conditions will make significant impact to uh, the regional happenings. So that's one. Two is that the causal drivers I've explained to you just now um, can has to be sort of considered in total. So uh, for today's purpose, I can't go into all of it. I show you the risk part. There is also to do a cost, to do a market, to do a finance or financialization. So in all those aspects need to be looked into. And finally is the issue of the state. Now the state used to be an enabler in global production. And in more recent years, and of course in the post pandemic era, the state could be a major constraint all right. So much so that I think in the minds of many of the executives in, uh, involved in global production, uh, the state is no longer just 
sort of a, a secondary concern, right? So government regulation, um, industrial policies can make a significant difference to how companies organize their global production activities. So it's in that sense that uh, some of these elements in our paper in the Journal of Economic Geography, we've outlined how uh, to understand GPN and development of a region, we need to look at the state as a GPN actor in its own right now, right? Rather than someone outside, something outside of GPN activities, we look at the kind of strategic coupling in order to see how some of those um, couplings that can be terribly disrupted through by unexpected risk. In my uh, regional studies paper, which came out of the regional studies annual lecture, I've given you one example of showing how, you know, if you like the GPN activities of uh, Taiwan is intimately linked to the sort of GPN activities of say a HP, have a packer in Silicon Valley on the left. So you will find two regions of the world very intimately interconnected through specific activity arranged by, in this case, HP, the company, yeah? So on and so forth, just a hypothetical example. Okay, so when it comes to understanding regional development, the trouble with global production networks is that we need to find out more about the, these three key issues in order to sort of deal with the post-pandemic challenges. One is again, technology I already mentioned at the beginning. Second is the network resilience issue. So some networks are more resilient than others, just like region. I mean, in regional studies, current big debate is about regional resilience, right? Same goes to GPN activity. So the networks are more resilient than others. Finally, is the politics part. The politics of GPN can be, can be very, very de, um, debilitating. Uh, in, for example, if you look at semiconductors, but on the other hand, um, I, I come from East Asia, so we are very used to state intervention. So you might have, heard of you know, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, even Singapore, right? The state is very big, very powerful, so on and so forth, historically. So the politics of state action is always complicated. I mean, to be fair, even in Europe, right? I mean, Western European regions, for example, there are Nordic countries that the state play much stronger role than uh, small states as well, so on and so forth. Okay, so in the final section, I will briefly go through uh, some electronics example to see what might be the possibilities for say, Central and Eastern Europe to consider. First is just to say that uh, the electronics industry comprises of uh, semiconductors, personal computers, mobile uh, smartphones, if you like, and consumer electronics. There is a fifth component called industrial, econo uh, industrial electronics, but not so big. By and large, if you look at electronics, it's very significant industry. If you see it as a whole, it's worth almost 20% of global merchandise exports. Uh, so it's a very, very significant industry. I know I'm in Germany. Germans love cars. Automotive industry, very important, right? But you know automotive, soon half of the car's value will be in electronics, right? So it's no longer just about machines. It's about the semiconductors, uh, electronic components and so on and so forth. So half of a car's value will be in electronics. That's why electronics will be very, very important in every single thing that we do. Now, to just give you some sense of what do you mean by uh, global production networks of value chain in electronics? Okay, just show you the semiconductor one, all right? Later, I will show you the PC and smartphone one, just give you some idea. If you look at the big debate about uh, 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 semiconductors, you will know that in semiconductor, on the left, you have firms that design chips, but they don't make any, just like Apple. Apple does design the chip, but doesn't make the chip. On the right-hand side, IDM refers to firms that design and make their own chips, such as Intel and Samsung, all right? So you have two kinds. For those that do not uh, make their chips, they have to outsource. So they outsource, for example, uh, Apple, uh, AMD, or NVIDIA were outsourced to Taiwanese, such as TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, or Samsung Foundry. And Samsung does also sort of third-party manufacturing. And then on the right-hand side, they make their own. But what is important is that you also have to look at the middle, all right, to enable the production of chips and design of chips, you need all kinds of highly specialized software and hardware and inputs. Every of this thing has very small number of suppliers, anything from one to three, all right? So in other words, if you want to do chip making, nobody, no country can do the entire value chain of semiconductor manufacturing. It's just not possible. So because of that, semiconductor manufacturing by definition is very global. All right, 
uh, you will see that um, you need equipment, you need uh, chemicals, you need all kinds of things. And we, we don't look at just the, the bottom part, all right? So the one that you need most, uh, most important one, this is really the current fight is ASML on the right, which makes that gigantic machine. You look at a human in blue, that's the human and the machine is gigantic, all right? I'm in Germany, so Germany makes a central component in that machine known as size lens. The lens is this very big lens, like the piano size that go into that machine, the purple color part, all right? And that purple color will be the light that shines through the size lens. And there are only so, so many German workers, skilled, highly skilled who can polish. And about 50 units of the lens can be made per year that go into the ASML machine. That photocopying machine is worth 200 million euro, all right? And that is the machine that China is not able to buy. And hence China cannot develop beyond uh, a certain level of sophistication. This will be a, uh, a simple illustration of your smartphone and, uh, and uh, um, um, notebook computers on the left and right. Again, you have leading brand names, whatever brand you have. Most, but it's very interesting that even in the same, in, same segment, smartphone, for example, Apple doesn't make a single phone, right? Samsung makes all of its own phone. Okay, then you have uh, Apple computers. Again, Apple doesn't make a single computer or outsource Taiwanese. And then you have Lenovo from China, which is currently the biggest, uh, makes about half of its uh, notebooks in-house. So you have a mix of different ways of organizing production networks. That's all I'm trying to tell you. And hence, you have many different opportunities to kind of capture some parts of that value chain activities in different regions of the world. Yet, there is a great deal of concentration in East Asia. This kind of map illustrates how global it is in the case of the chip design. Uh, you have Silicon Valley design the chip, uh, manufacturing taking place in East Asia, and then uh, put into the devices that go into your smartphone and machines assemble say in Asia, and of course sell to worldwide, yeah? And then uh, Wellhofen is where ASML is based that makes that sophisticated machine, which is absolutely necessary because it's like the photocopying machine in the most advanced chip making. So that machine, uh, ASML is the monopoly currently, the 200 million euro machine, I remember. Okay, so what's in for you? Now, what we know from empirical research is that interestingly, Electronics is not all assembled in China, in China or Asia. Certain segments of electronics are highly globalized in production, such as desktop computer. So desktop computer is, China assembled no more than half of the world's desktop, right? Uh, in smartphone, there are again many uh, um, small scale manufacturers in different parts of the world. In TV, TV is quite big. So again, you have TV assembly and production worldwide. All right, not just in Asia and China. So that's important to know, yeah? uh, including Central and Eastern Europe. I will show you a little bit. Now, first, give you some idea of semiconductors. Semiconductor is indeed highly concentrated. Uh, there is almost nothing in Central and Eastern Europe. There is quite a lot in Western Europe, partly historically associated with Siemens, which is today's engineering. Dan Phillips from the Netherlands, today is NXP. Uh, and as well as, of course, the same company that remains the same, ST Micro from France, Italy, uh, John Venture. All right, so these are the three big European semiconductor manufacturing. Uh, in my paper in economic geography recently, I've got this table. If you look at Europe, all right, uh, for today's purpose, you don't bother with the type of chips, logic, memory, and uh, foundry chip. But if you look at Europe 2018 data, Europe's total semiconductor manufacturing is about one. 019 underlined in red. 1019 means uh, out of 1000. So it's about 1 million wafer per month. You make 1 million wafer, 12, uh, no, 8 inch, 8 inch wafer per month. That's the measurement, all right? We use total capacity. The whole of Europe add up is about the same. Uh, Singapore is actually slightly more. So in other words, we are a little city in Asia. We make as much semiconductor in terms of capacity as the whole of Europe added up. And you can, you can imagine something is wrong there, isn't it? And that's why it's fair to say Europe should and would like to develop much more semiconductor manufacturing capacity. Now, when you do that, then there are opportunities for Central and Eastern Europe. 
Central and Eastern Europe may not be able to make the chips, but be, may be able to develop facilities to test, to package the chips. Uh, we call pack uh, APT, APT for uh, um, APT, uh, assembly, packaging, and testing of the chips, which is more labor intensive, which is low value added, but it's a good way to start getting involved in semiconductor industry, so to speak. All right. Uh, for today's purpose, we don't look at you know all the other guys like U.S. capacity. So you look, U.S. capacity is 1770, 1.7 million wafer per month, which is which is about the same as Japan, 1.6 million. But South Korea, you see, is 2.5 million, and Taiwan is gigantic, almost three million wafers a month, and in the more sophisticated segment of chip manufacturing. Now you can quite understand why the U.S. is desperate now. In, in redeveloping its semiconductor industry. Considering the fact that Intel and the US dominated semiconductor for three decades, four decades, yeah? Intel invented the very first chip integrated circuit. Okay, this table gives you some idea of the manufacturing of uh, compute, uh, smartphones, personal handsets, personal computers, and television by region. What I want to show you is the role of Eastern Europe. So Eastern Europe is quite significant in TV manufacturing, as you can tell. The last part, all right, you have 25% uh, 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 I think. Yeah, no, 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 25 refers to 25 million units, I think, uh, per year. 25 million unit, units per year out of two, uh, 221 million worldwide, all right? So it's about slightly over 12%. Uh, if you look at um, personal computer desktop is under others, all right? Out of the 26 others, uh, a significant portion will be done in Czech and Poland as well. Um, however, in mobile handset, um, there is not much, if I recall correctly. I think it's in the next table I'm gonna show you. Now, this is, this is in top six desktop PC, all right? So desktop PC, you will see that in Czech, um, assembled by a, a Taiwanese company called Foxconn. Foxconn, you might have heard of the primary assembler of iPhone in China, yeah? But Foxconn has worldwide factories, including in uh, Czech Republic on the right-hand side, Foxconn. Uh, of course, the, the, the production uh, numbers may change because my data is up to 2015, 2018 for HP. So Foxconn's assembly of HP in Czech Republic for the European market. If you look at in-house production, Lenovo on the left also has um, in-house production facility in Poland, right? which is the right-hand uh, right side picture. So the moral of the story is that it's not that Central and Eastern Europe do not have a role in uh, smartphone or uh, computers. You have, it's not big, can be done much more uh, given the political challenges and global restructuring happening. Uh, if you look at, TV production, look at the right-hand side, right? Uh, 20 million TV assembled in the Foxconn factory in Slo I think it's in Slovakia, all right? And even you, there is a specific uh, celebration, a milestone achieved, so to speak. Uh, if you look at uh, in-house production, Samsung has in-house production in Eastern Europe, uh, in TV and so on and so forth. Uh, so the moral of the story is, again, there are certain elements of uh, the global electronics industry that Central and Eastern Europe have already played some role in global production networks. Of course, those roles can be greatly enhanced for the following reasons. Because you have new market dynamics in Europe, you will imagine that given the geopolitical tensions going on right at the beginning, uh, and of course, China currently the zero COVID policy, you're going to have more likelihood of production to be set up within the European context, at least to serve the European market. So I would expect that to happen. Um, and hence this idea of serving domestic market will be a significant incentive uh, for some of these assemblers to set up their assembly activities. But then that equally will pull in some of the suppliers and ecosystem development through, of course, necessary local and regional or even national state policies in support of those uh, industrial development uh, strategies. The EU has to be seen as a significant domestic market for ICT products, increasingly um, pulling out 
uh, from some parts of Asia. The market access could be a, a critical issue, uh, subject to again regulatory changes, which will in turn enhance, I would imagine, possibility for Central and Eastern Europe to insert into uh, global production networks. So I think this is the last slide whereby I would sort of make some suggestions when it comes to possible policy considerations, kind of bearing in mind some of the success stories in uh, East Asia, right? So developing industri industries is not about having entire value chain in one location or even the whole continent. It's about specializing in specific niches. It's kind of the idea not too far from uh, smart specialization, right? I mean, in the European, con I think when I say smart specialization, most Europe-based colleagues here will, 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 will easily understand. So in Asia, I have to explain to them what smart specialization means, all right? In Europe, I don't think I need to do that, all right? But the idea of uh, insertion is into global production networks is to kind of find the, the right a smart segment uh, for the European regions and uh, localities to go in. Uh, Asia has been lucky through a combination of historical factors, which I got, can't go into great detail, but Asia was selected in early days for the internationalization, for example, of American electronics firms that in turn leads to country, I mean, economies like Taiwan, Singapore to benefit from those early internationalization. South Korea copied from the Japanese model and managed to develop very large companies, right? Uh, however, you don't necessarily have to go through the same route, right? There are many ways of bringing in, if you like, segments of uh, GPN and GVC activities. I think that's the first conclusion. Second is to say nationalization wouldn't work, all right? Because if you nationalize uh, uh, value chains, what it means is that it will just reduce the kind of operational efficiencies so much so that the overall competitiveness will go down uh, eventually. Uh, so nationalization, generally speaking, don't, don't work well, all right? Uh, except maybe in say, critical medical supply during the most pressing moments of COVID, so to speak. Huh? But even in cheap uh, supply issues, it's not going to work because uh, fact, every factory takes two to three years to build in uh, semiconductor manufacturing. Now, we know the China-centric global production model is going to be changed. That is for sure. But how much change we are still observing, nobody can tell you a conclusive answer. But what is clear is that more and more firms, governments, customers, one diversification from China only production model. So in that sense, there is great opportunity even for me from Singapore to say that in Southeast Asia, we can benefit from that China plus one plus two plus three model. So much so that Vietnam, for example, is the classic example of having benefited from, if you like, diversification from China. But I cannot see any reason why Central and Eastern Europe cannot also, if you like, take this opportunity to capture that if you like exit from China, not complete exit, but some exit out of China, right? But that requires the kind of pro-ecosystem development uh, approach. The idea is that you need to develop a certain production ecosystem in the industry that the locality and regions want to specialize in, because without which it's very difficult to bring in uh, some of these production activities. So um, I think my overall conclusion is to say that given uh, our conference theme on global dynamics. I think global dynamics currently are not so in favor of concentration in a particular location. Indeed, um, global dynamics in the past two, three years have shown us that there is a great deal of possibilities for new localities and regions such as Central and Eastern Europe to play a greater role in global production activities in the industries that you have not uh, gone into it in great uh, detail yet. Of course, Western Europe has its own interests and so on and so forth. And here we are somewhere in between in the middle. So I think in, in that sense, um, I, I personally, I feel European regions as a whole should have much greater uh, presence in, uh, in the global electronics industry. There is no reason other, I mean, not to, right? So with that, I thank you. And uh, we have time for Q&A. I bring the mic back to Joseph to chair it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Henry, for uh, this uh, uh, thoughtful uh, lecture and uh, especially uh, linking uh, your experience in the electronic uh, industry research to, uh, to Central and Eastern Europe showing up also uh, 
what possibilities are uh, for uh, this region in a, in a future maybe new international division of labor. So uh, the floor is open for questions and please, uh, should I bring the microphone to you? Or you know, there is a microphone in the room. Please, I don't think so that uh, the, the moderator will be needed so that the questions can flow and uh, Henry will, will answer them. Uh, hello, uh, Nadia Johannesova from the Czech Republic. Thank you for an interesting presentation. Uh, but from another perspective, uh, don't you think that one of the troubles with these global value chains is also environmental costs caused by the transport of all these uh, uh, parts, semiconductors and so on? And the second question is when you speak about efficiency, isn't it true that on the other hand, efficiency may mean externalization of costs onto communities, onto nature, onto workers? Thank you. Okay, uh, maybe I just go one by one then if that's um first is to answer um i don't personally i don't particularly uh, research on the environmental impact of uh, gpn activities there are many studies of um, environmental sustainabilities my colleagues in the gvc group for example uh, my own reading of the literature is that uh, okay of course everything we do has environmental cost question is how much more uh, generally in academic terms we say what's the counterfactuality in other words uh, if you want your iphone then uh, what would be the other scenario if the iphone production is organized differently yeah so we call counterfactuality uh, it seems that global production currently at least in the electronics industry i'm familiar with is to say that there are greater initiatives to protect the environment through for example um um, the minerals use. Uh, so there are environmental certifications uh, in the uh, inputs segment of global electronics. But in terms of the factories you're looking at, then there are bound to be having environmental impact in terms of emission, in terms of, of course, uh, uh, fuel consumption, if you like, distance travel and so on and so forth. So I will not deny that there are environmental uh, implications with regard to production taking place beyond uh, all in one place. But then, of course, the contrary to that is that to make everything in one place, you will also create tremendous environmental impact because then you have to source worldwide all kinds of ingredients. You see what I'm saying? So ultimately, I don't have an easy solution that, uh, to, to assess the environmental impact. Um, you do have to look at the counterfactual uh, uh, scenario. In other words, what if production is done all in one place? what will be the environmental costs of bringing everything in worldwide? Uh, and that's the reshoring uh, initiative. Uh, that will be the very big challenge to the reshoring, reshoring back to, to say, for example, can the iPhone be made in uh, the US? The answer is yes, it can be done, but at tremendous economic and environmental costs to the USA, which Americans may not want it, eh? so to speak. So I'm, I, I don't have food answer i hope you understand that part but uh, i'm just thinking of how we might want to uh, examine it further through counterfactuality studies on labor now that one is a big issue there are many studies across um, many different industries in gvc gpn studies look at labor standards uh, social upgrading in terms of work environment uh, wages and so on and so forth to the localities uh, in fact last month i was in the newcastle royal geographical society annual meeting uh, there are studies of, say, Cambodia uh, garment industry, uh, again, work conditions and so on and so forth. So um, what I can say is that it's always, diff how do I put it, at the, at, the, at the initial phase of industrialization, low value uh, activities, uh, workers in factories almost always tend to be exploited more than those who are in high value added activities. So if you contrast, well, although actually there are studies done on Italian fashion industry districts, Italian districts, that workers are exploited just as much as the workers in China and uh, Cambodia. So the moral story I want to say is that uh, I cannot give you a definitive answer. If you organize it this way, there will be a much better working environment and so on and so forth. It's very sector specific sometimes, also very uh, location specific, subject to specific regulations and so on. So I hope that sort of gives you some idea of the difficulties in we as scholars trying to understand what environment issues. 
basically environmental and work environment issues are two very, very difficult issues to deal with in, in this kind of uh, globalized activities, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. Zoltan Gael uh, from Hungary. You refer to the uh, issue of backshoring and uh, reshoring. Uh, um, this is particularly important for the European context, but also it was interesting to see that how Europe is neglected or left out from uh, the main driver of digitalization or industry 4.4 is also semiconductor and, and cheap product production. So this is this is a kind of unique things that Europe uh, not leading in Asia and, and US. So do you think is uh, this Asian strategic coupling uh, and, and uh, in these sectors can be challenged or is it a, a kind of option for 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 Europe to to backshoring or or uh, uh, creating their indigenous or, or, or separate uh, semiconductor or, or, or cheap industry in cooperation with, with uh, near shoring in Eastern Europe. So is it a kind of opportunity uh, for this kind of, or possible to challenge this kind of Asian uh, GPN? Thank you, thank you. Uh, good to see you. And uh, um, okay. The uh, industry 4.0 is how do I put it? Is is a is a an approach uh, that can be applied and has taken place across different industries. And in European context, uh, one may argue automotive industry is doing 4.0. Uh, particularly Germany is doing very well. Yeah, in that sense. So in so I can't really answer the 4.0 question. I can, for example, talk about say semiconductors, automotive. So if you look at semiconductor industry. Uh, your fundamental question is how come Europe has kind of lost its competitiveness in semiconductors uh, over the decades? I mean, if you think of the 1970s and 80s, Europe was still kind of reasonably competitive then. Japan was also very big. And of course, America was leading. Uh, Taiwan was just catching up at that time. South Korea was just catching up. So now the catch up ones, the so-called tigers, right? Asian tigers uh, have grown to be very fierce. Huh? So. Uh, so what happened to the European lions, uh, for the, I mean, metaphorically? Semiconductor today is very difficult to catch up. Uh, the reason is because the investment is gigantic. Now, let me give you a sense of scale. Remember, I showed you Europe's, uh, uh, Europe Chip Act is about 43 or so billion euro, right? About 43 billion euro. It's big money, isn't it? 43 billion. Now, let me give you an example. Taiwan, Taiwan's Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, TSMC, one firm. Yes, globally, the most advanced firm today in making chips. TSMC this year is investing 42 billion US dollar by itself. So can you imagine one firm can invest 42 billion in building chip factories? And the whole of Europe is thinking of 43 billion euro. Yeah, it's a bit more. Uh, but you know, by the time you figure out the X, uh, US is 52 billion US. It's, it's not a lot, all right? Samsung is pledging something like 200 billion uh, US dollar investment in the next five years. So we are talking about very large scale investment by leading firms. Now you may say, hey, what about European firms? Can we invest in that kind of scale? Cannot. So Invenient, NXP, ST Micro, these three big European semiconductor firms have given up the most advanced technologies long time ago. By most advanced means, these three firms are very, very powerful in making um, not the most advanced chips, okay? <laughs> Make it easy for you to understand. So these three are making chips that are very, um, uh, they're they not the processor chips, all right? So for example, they're making power chips, sensor chips that are necessary in the automotive industry. And that's why Infineon, NXP and ST Micro are controlling the automotive industry very well, all right? But it's not making the chips that go into your iPhone, so to speak, all right? So smartphone chips, PC chips tend to be done by uh, Asian manufacturers and Intel. Only these few firms can do. So because of that, Semicon uh, catching up at the most advanced level, very difficult, but continued consolidation of Euro actually Europe's dominance actually in the automotive chips, power chips, uh, means power supply chips, um, 
European semiconductor firms have already done very well. So that can be expanded. But to encourage them to invest in Europe is the necessary step, meaning encourage Infineon, NXP. NXP was formerly Philips Semiconductor, yeah? Infineon, formerly Siemens Semiconductor, Germany. And uh, ST Micro, uh, remember, Italian French firm. Huh? So can be done. In other words, there is a way out, but not catching up with the most advanced guys which is entirely possible. Second is actually something that I thought can be done, which is to build up more um, uh, testing and assembly uh, packaging uh, activities that in turn perhaps attract future Asian semicon firms like the TSMC, Samsung to set up fabs. Fabs means chip making factories in Europe. Yeah, so that takes time, few years, but that will be something I think is conceivable, okay? Yeah. Uh, we have question in front. I, you use my mic. Uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Henry, for uh, an excellent presentation. Very fascinating. Uh, I'm Nadir Kinosin from Leibniz Institute for Regional Geography. Uh, I find it fascinating that you know it takes a major shock, like shortage of supply and you know absence of units that you know countries start thinking about nationalization or reshoring. So, as well as, you know, took Gazprom to cut off gas supply that Germany starts thinking about how to replace it. So it's kind of shows how limited understanding of risk in the model world is. Do you have any explanation for that? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the very important question. Uh, it's fair to say this whole idea of kind of globalization unlimited was kind of assumed, right? Until kind of, really until Donald Trump imposed tariffs, right? 2016 onwards on China. Uh, by then, of course, as you remember, Donald Trump also imposed some tariffs on certain segments of European industries. Yeah? So by then we realized, ha, huh, the US also can play cheat because we expected the US to be very open, liberal, neoliberalized, da, 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 market oriented. So if you look at the world economy since 2016, major powers like the US started, if you like not following the WHO, I mean, uh, WTO, sorry, WHO, w, World Trade Organization, sort of free trade regime of the world. Then we realized that actually, many production network supply chains across the world can be disrupted through government policies one way or another yeah now how to deal with that and i think to be fair whether we consumers or uh, politicians or uh, economic actors have learned the lesson you're not going to go back to the so-called just-in-time system that everything is so exact in different uh, location uh, across the world and everything so well coordinated it's not going to work anymore. I think, um, I think nobody realistically expects this to, to, to happen again in the next 10 years. And that's why it creates currently all kinds of opportunities for kind of rethinking, remapping production activities worldwide right? that in turn create opportunities for every locality and regions to secure more, sort of pull down more of those kind of global flows, so to speak. So in that sense, well, the Chinese saying always that there is a crisis, but there is also opportunity, right? So the crisis is crisis of global production, opportunities for local and regional transformations. That's probably something that we will be able to study uh, in greater detail. Of course, through uh, you, need, you need actual empirical work to do this. Yeah? Currently, we are talking in theoretical terms. I can say a bit about electronics, given I'm familiar with it. But having said that, there are many other industries which, which will experience this uh, global restructuring uh, at the industry level, um, primarily due to this risk factor. Risk is not just geopolitical, but also environmental as well, so on and so forth. So um, yeah, I mean, we will have a lot more to study, opportunities for academics too, in that sense, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Otherwise we've got no topics to study, right? <laughs> so, okay, I pass the mic back to, Thank you very much. Uh, Tadeusz Trynakiewicz, Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznań, in Poland. Uh, I too was impressed uh, by your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, at the end of your presentation, you have mentioned 
new opportunities for strategic coupling in Central and Eastern Europe countries. Um, my question is, don't you think that the recent geopolitical events, especially the war in Ukraine, can reduce or weaken these opportunities for the whole region of Central and Eastern Europe? What is your opinion on this matter? Thank you. Um, I suppose you, you, you raise this probably from a kind of security perspective, right? Right. Uh, which I presume uh, it has to be addressed uh, by national governments and the EU because national security is fundamental. Without security, nothing we can talk about. But having said that, uh, it also should not preclude uh, economic planners, regional planners from thinking about sort of different scenarios, right? Scenarios such as, uh, well, of course, the best scenario will be uh, Russia will be kicked out of uh, Ukraine completely, right? <laughs> Uh, otherwise, at least wouldn't have advanced beyond what it is now. So in that scenario, there is no reason why Central and Eastern Europe cannot try to capture more of the reshuffling of activities on a global scale. So in that sense, I would say, um, I kind of none of us can predict what ultimately will happen in five to 10 years time, but that shouldn't, that shouldn't sort of... Uh, stop us from taking so-called preemptive measures to develop, if you like, opportunities for local regions in the respective countries. Yeah. So I wouldn't want to say the, 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 the security uncertainty will have dampened Central and Eastern European opportunities because I, I'm still thinking that Europe being a big market may over time reduce its dependency from, say, importing from, say, Asia, which is entirely possible, right? And in that sense, you have a very big home market in Central and Eastern Europe for the entire European market. Um, because we cannot also be sure that the world trade regime may also change over time. So, so it's in that sense that I see no reason why. Uh, in fact, this is a good moment for Central and Eastern Europe to do it. If you, this is perhaps as good a moment as it can be, yeah. Uh, otherwise, imagine five years ago, Central and Eastern Europe say, oh, we want to develop um, all these new industries. That would be tough because China was so dominant at that time. See what I'm saying? This is the time when there is scope for thinking of moving beyond China. It's in that sense that there are opportunities for many of us, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, I'm Marcus Sattler from the uh, Leibniz, Institute, uh, Leibniz Institute for Regional Geography. And first of all, I have to say I'm really adapted to the global production network perspective. So it's a perfect chance also to ask a question right now, which I want to connect to the initial statement uh, of Matthias Middel, who said one of the challenges will be to think globalization as opposed to the 1990s from a less anthropocentric perspective. Mm. And so I'm wondering, as I understand, regional development is mostly defined as this kind of value capture. Mm. And to what extent the uh, idea about value capture as articulated in GPN wants to and can also tackle this problem of a less anthropocentric perspective of what it means to have regional development. Can you just say a few more words about your interpretation of the anthropocentric? Yeah. Okay. No, I, I can just say, for example, I also read uh, Dickens' Global Shift, like probably many economic geographers. And there is this whole, uh, let's say, trinity in GPN about value creation, enhancement, and capture. Mm. And then you have this one chapter, for example, inside that book where he also talks about value destruction and where he talks about the environmental effects in uh, um, let's say GPNs. Uh, and here I just think that the focus or the value term that is employed might be, I'm not sure, it might be very much still into this uh, metaphysics of, of human mastery over nature, mm. uh, where basically the, the value of nature is not valued at all, where most of the value is designed or goes towards human labor. Uh, and I'm just wondering this perspective to what extent also the, the GPN which emerged in precisely this more anthropocentric uh, epoch, how it could tackle this call for having, let's say, a less anthropocentric take also on globalization. 
Okay, I get it. I get it better now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, because when you first mentioned anthropocentric, I thought um, you're talking about post-humanism. In, in, in critical human geography, it's quite, quite hot now, talking about post-humanism stuff. So uh, lately, I've been looking into a philosophy of the human geography. So I have another book, uh, which is not nothing to do with this electronic stuff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and tying back to the first question also about uh, environmental costs of uh, all these um, new activities, it's fair to say uh, current general thinking on economic development doesn't take into environmental costs, climate change, uh, as much as it should be. That one is clear, straightforward. Uh, we are, I mean, we means those of us who do economic analysis tend to be guilty of that. Uh, the biggest difficulty, of course, is how to account for environmental uh, conditions and so on. Um, I don't have a unique, as I said uh, earlier in the in answer to the first question, that I don't have unique um, insights into this. I mean, now that I'm pressed to deal with this question, I have to say, uh, we as consumers, personally, I think it has to be done through regulatory means. I mean, I cannot think of... I mean, we can do moral persuasion. People consume locally, consume less, throw away your smartphone. But at the end of the day, then you say, oh, I needed to contact my family members. So I think human nature-wise, I don't realistically think we can easily change collectively our behavior. We can change individually. But I can only think of regulatory means. Really means that regulatory uh, constraints on uh, global production activities that require environmental costs to be fully accounted for. So, for example, uh, you go, uh, you measure, you know, like uh, I think in certain European supermarkets, you actually have the uh, mileage travel of that bottle of uh, milk, let's say, so much so that then uh, consumers will, will be able to choose if like the less mile traveled products, so on and so forth. So, all this have to go through regulatory uh, uh, means in order to kind of almost like the next phone you buy, you will know the environmental cost. Then you will make a conscious choice to buy Apple or buy Samsung or buy another one that is actually environmentally more friendly. Yeah, products, so to speak. But I have no unique insight except to say like what I've just said. Uh, this requires a lot more careful, um, not just a lot more careful research. There is, as I said, GVC study that look at environmental sustainability, uh, but tend to look at, for example, Italian wine regions. Uh, tend to look at, uh, if I recall correctly, what else industry to look at? Uh, uh, fishery industries tend to look at agro food industries because those industry environmental issues are more direct, so to speak. Um, so hopefully I've given you some, some of my responses, which I, I fully understand is not adequate, uh, but I hope you give, it give you some idea, my own thinking on this. Yeah. Okay. And then the front. Ah, okay. Yeah, my name is Tilo. I'm part of the local organizing team, also Leibniz Institute for Regional Geography. I've been always inspired by this idea of strategic coupling, but I'm also very critical to it, uh, particularly when you start thinking it through from a non-core economy peripheral perspective. So if you're saying, and I agree this is probably the case in the current economy, uh, in a high-tech economy like the electronics industry, there is no other way of global organization beyond the one that we're having right now. Probably this is true for all kinds of high-tech parts of the economy. Second thing, if we say the to make a good life, to have a, a nice regional uh, development, uh, you need to have share of these global production networks from the higher end. But, but this is not a strategy that can work for the whole world. So what, what, what is the alternative? If, if we say these two axioms are set, so high-tech industries cannot be differently organized than global. And if we want to maintain good regional development, we have to catch uh, as highest possible shares of the upper end of the GPN. So what's the development perspective for uh, non-core economies. We are well placed in Europe, also in Eastern Europe. We have advanced economies. We have the training in place, we have the educational systems. Uh, it's a feasible strategy. Uh, but what's what's your answer thinking this through from a non-core economy perspective? 
Yeah, thank you. Again, th this is a very difficult question to answer as usual. I still remember maybe five, six years ago when I gave uh, a so-called so training session to some parliamentarians uh, of Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation. And I think one guy from the uh, Bhutan, Bhutan's uh, Ministry of Finance official asked me, oh, so in Bhutan, uh, can we develop semiconductors? And I said, but you are the happiest country on earth. Why do you want to bring chip making to your country? It's going to pollute your environment. You need a lot of water and electricity and so on. You know, you do what you're best at. What are you best at? I mean, one is to do tourism, so on and so forth. So the moral of the story is that uh, whatever regions you are in, well, if you believe in smart specialization, is that you should have something that the region can do quite well in whether presently or possibly in future. And to identify those activities, those activities can just mean a locally oriented agro-fruit production. Doesn't have to be high-tech industries. I mentioned high-tech because I studied those. And Taiwan used to be the peripheral economies. Even Singapore, we used to be no nothing, same thing. South Korea used to be very poor. Yeah. So it's in, and even today, South Korea is not all of South Korea's regions uh, have a big stake in uh, Samsung or in uh, semiconductors. There are peripheral regions in South Korea. It's no different from there are peripheral regions in Germany that have no big stake in the German automotive industry, for example, which Germany is famous for, right? So on and so forth. So the short answer is to say uh, peripheral regions. Um, do want, I mean, assuming peripheral regions do want to develop better, then the real question is how will that, that sort of future vision be arrived at? And, and hence that process requires researcher, politicians, um, 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 sort of local citizens to participate, right, in the discussion. And hence arriving at something, and that collective action is, is in itself a very difficult political process. And hence then, what we can do if we are more familiar with certain kind of global industries and the ways in which global industries are organized is to provide some options on the table for, if you like, again, the local collective to discuss. Because ultimately, the choice will be the, the people and the elected officials and so on and so forth, not the academics telling the officials what to do. See what I'm saying? So my, my overall answer is to say strategic coupling is just one of the possibilities. Um, and purely endogenous, local-oriented development is conceivable, but I do not know the, the, how do I put it? I do not know whether the outcomes are satisfactory to the people in the region. And that in itself is subject to country, locality specificity. It varies from country to country, localities to localities. I hope I've given you some of my thought. Uh, no easy answer. This is... The most difficult question, actually, uh, actually is the, the reason for existence of your wonderful institute. Am I right? <laughs> so, thank you. We have uh, five minutes left from this session. Maybe there are there is still room for one or two questions. If not, thank you very much, Henry, again. Thank you. Thank you. I will be around, yeah. So feel free to uh, chat further. Uh, for this tremendous effort to come from Singapore, and uh, we wish you also uh, two or three other uh, wonderful days in Leipzig, also in the name of the organizers. We have uh, now coffee break in uh, room uh, in hall number one. If you remember the, where, where the registration took part, there is the same place for the coffee. Thank you very much. <laughs>